Let us pray. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who, when your disciples and friends deserted and left you, remained alone in the hands of sinful men, like a most gentle lamb within the jaws of a ravenous wolf. Strengthen my excessive weakness and confirm my too great unstableness by the support of your grace, and join me to yourself with the bonds of love, that I may neither have no wish nor the power ever to depart or separate myself from you. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who allowed yourself to be led around bound by an armed band and taken to Annas, allowing yourself to be stood before him as though you were a common criminal or robber. O unspeakable gentleness of my Redeemer, look, while they take and drag and thrust you forward, you uttered not a single word of complaint or murmur or word of resistance, but in silence you followed them wherever they led you, obeying their commands and permitted their wanton injuries to you. Grant, O Lord, that these your virtues may shine in me to the everlasting glory of your name. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, King of heaven and earth, who in great humility, as poor and needy and of no account, was stood before the proud high priest and most sweetly endured the dreadful blow which his impious servant put upon you. Restrain, I beg you, in me all outbreak of anger and passion. Suppress all acts of indignation and quench with me all, within me all desire of revenge, that when I am provoked by injury I may not be disturbed, I may, not, may offer no resistance, may suffer no disquiet, but endure everything with a quiet mind. May I even repay evil with good. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who permitted himself to be led bound in a shameful manner to Caiaphas, that you might deliver us from the penalty of eternal death, restoring to us true liberty. Make me most ready to endure every reproach and all contempt for your name's sake. Grant that in the very middle of ridicule and outrage I may give you thanks with a perfect heart and by means of these trials may grow and increase more and more in your love. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who, when three times denied by your Apostle Peter, mercifully turned and looked upon him with kindness and brought him to repentance and holy sorrow for his sin. In like manner, may you turn upon me also your eye of mercy and love, that I may weep over my past sins with the tears of true penitence, and may never again commit them. May I never be found sinning against your goodness in word or deed. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who stood before the elders and the people of the Jews with a calm countenance and humble look, who did not refuse to be falsely accused and to suffer many injuries. Give me grace never to say an untrue word, or to falsely accuse my neighbour, but that I may bear with all quietness of heart the calumnies that are heaped upon me. Casting all my troubles upon you, may I always in silence look for the grave and consolation at your hands. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who, when Caiaphas the high priest, adjured you by the name of God, declared the truth and proclaimed yourself the Son of God, and did not refuse to be counted by him and the rest who stood by as a blasphemer. May I fully abhor this contempt and offence against you. May in I in every place reverence the, respect, the presence of your divinity and majesty. May I think of you, adore, praise and love you, above all things, for ever and for ever. Amen. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouths shall sing your praise.
A reading from the Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapters 13 and 14. Now when Jesus finished these parables, he moved on from there. He came to his hometown and began to teach the people in their synagogue. They were astonished and said, Where did this man get such wisdom and miraculous powers? Is this not the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother named Mary, and aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? And aren't all his sisters here with us? So where did they get all this? And so they took offence at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honour except in his hometown and in his own house. And he did not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard reports of Jesus, and he said to his servants, This must be John the Baptist, he has been raised from the dead. And because of this, miraculous powers are at work in him. For Herod had arrested John, bound him, and had put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife because John had repeatedly told him, It is not lawful for you to have her. Although Herod wanted to kill John, he feared the crowd, because they accepted John as a prophet. But on Herod's birthday, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod, so much that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she asked. On her mother's instructions she said, Give me the head of John the Baptist here on a plate. Although it grieved the king, because of his oath and his dinner guests, he commanded it to be given. And so he sent and had John beheaded in the prison, and his head was brought on a plate and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother. Then John's disciples came, and took the body and buried it, going on to tell Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today's Gospel breaks down into two distinct components. First of all, we have the visit of Jesus to his own town. He had lived there for nearly 30 years, from infancy to manhood. It was but a small place, and so everybody would know him. Some would have been at school with him in the synagogue. Some would have been friends of the family. Some would have bought their ploughs and yokes at his father's carpenter's shop. He'd been absent for a while, and during that absence the unknown village carpenter had become the most conspicuous figure in the Holy Land. The Nazarenes had wonders as they heard of his mighty works and strange influences from his teaching. They must have felt some natural pride in the eminence of their countrymen. But their admiration was tingled with unworthy feelings, jealousy and envy. Holiness is not often popular. Ungodly men feel it as a rebuke to themselves, and they hate it. Jesus went to the synagogue, as was his wont. The Lord always attended public worship. In this, as in all things, he is our example. It was known that he would be there, and the Nazarenes flocked to hear him. Their motives would have been different, but all were drawn by eager desire to listen to the great preacher. We cannot tell for certain whether this visit, recorded also in St. Mark, is to be regarded as the same as that described in Luke chapter 4. We only know that the congregation was filled with astonishment now, as they were on that occasion. The Lord's words were deep and full of holy wisdom. 
Never man spoke such as this. They had been told of his wisdom, and now they heard it themselves, and they wondered greatly. And they whispered together about our Lord's humble origin. He was the son, they thought, of the carpenter Joseph, who they remembered so well. The good man now gone to claim his reward, the son of David. But yet the village carpenter, the Nazarenes forgot his royal descent. They forgot the higher nobility of goodness which had distinguished him. They thought only of his humble occupation. He was a carpenter, they said, only a carpenter. And this preacher who spoke with such authority was, they supposed, the carpenter's son. Mary was his mother, and they knew her well. She lived long amongst them. And there were brothers too, and sisters, children, in all probability, of Joseph by a former marriage, brought up with the Lord, older than he, which, perhaps, may serve to explain their assumption of authority that we see elsewhere. It is a thought of deep interest that the blessed Lord had lived with brothers and sisters as part of a larger family. He felt the family's joys and its troubles, the sweetness of affection, and at times, perhaps, the vexation of jarring wills. For brothers and sisters would not have been as he was, sinless and without spot. His brothers, we know, did not at this time believe in him. We can only wonder how the sisters regarded his exalted holiness, his perfect purity and his tender love. Holy Scripture has hidden from us the details of our Lord's domestic life, but it is sweet to think that he lived as we too have lived, and to regard him as our example in all the varied relations of family life. And they were offended by him. Their previous knowledge of him, of his early life among him, among them, of his occupation, of his family, was a stumbling block to them. They could not get over it. They stumbled and fell. And yet his life had been an example of unparalleled innocence and holiness. They had loved him in his holy childhood, when he increased in wisdom and stature, and in favour with God and man. But there was no way that they were ready to receive the carpenter's son as the Messiah. Let us learn not to despise the poor, the lowly. Let no Christian dare to look down on honest trade. The Lord Christ was once a carpenter. The humble in earthly rank may be very high in holiness, first in the kingdom of heaven. A prophet is not without honour. A prophet, a true man who speaks for God, who speaks in simplicity and earnestness, out of the abundance of his heart. Such a man is not without honour, for he is honoured of God, and eventually he will be honoured of men, but not necessarily in his lifetime. But at last, when death raises him above the petty jealousies of life, men will come to admit that there had been a prophet in their midst, and will render him that meed of honour, which perhaps in this his lifetime they so studiously kept from him. But he is not always, indeed, rarely honoured in his own country and in his own house. Men do not envy those very high above them in rank and wealth, or those far removed from them in any way. They envy most those who are nearest to them in place and time and circumstance. And so it is in this case today. His fellow countrymen held him not in honour. His brethren did not believe in him. We suffer from the envy of others. Let us think of Jesus. He was despised and rejected by his own family. He may well be content if the disciple 
is as his master. And oh, let us drive envy out of our hearts. It kept the Nazarenes from Christ, and he keeps men from Christ today. The envious simply cannot know the one who is the personification of love. And so his presence was not blessed to them. He could not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. He was there, the Saviour, the mighty Son of God. But his presence brought little blessing to them. It was not the mere bodily presence of the Christ that saved and blessed. He could do no mighty work, says St. Mark, save that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. The Lord's miracles of healing were not mere displays of power, but they had a spiritual meaning. Faith was required in the recipient. He does not exercise his power arbitrarily. It is directed by his wise and holy will. A few had faith, and those few he healed. The unbelieving derived no benefit from his visit. And how earnestly should we pray today, Lord, increase our faith. So then we come to part two and the death recorded here of John the Baptist. Who was this Herod the Tetrarch, the villain of the peace? Herod Antipas was a weak, cruel, voluptuous tyrant. He resembled his father in his vices, not in his capacity and energy of character. He had heard of Christ's miracles, and it seems strange if, as the words appear to imply, he only now heard of Christ for the first time, for Christ had long been preaching in Galilee. For at least a year and perhaps a little longer, great multitudes were flocking to hear him. His mighty works had excited a far-spread interest and wonder. So where had Herod been? that he had not heard before of Christ. He may indeed have been absent from Galilee during much of this time, perhaps at the distant fortress of Macarius, where John the Baptist was imprisoned. But his life was spent in ostentatious display and sensual excess. He would take little or no interest in a religious movement unless his fears were aroused by the popular excitement which it caused. His courtiers would not listen themselves to the preaching of Jesus, or if any did, such as the nobleman whose son was healed by the Lord at Capernaum, or Chusa, Herod's steward, perhaps indeed that very nobleman, whose wife Joanna ministered to our Lord. They would not relate to the hard-hearted, selfish tyrant teaching so uncongenial to his character. The miracles, it is true, would excite more interest. They would stir up some curiosity. And eventually it seems that some account of them reached him at last. And thus the ruler of Gal Galilee was perhaps one of the last men in the province to hear of Jesus of Nazareth. The great in this world are not always great in the kingdom of heaven. The tumult of political players and the glitter of earthly pomp regularly prevent them from hearing the fame of Jesus. His blessed work goes on amongst the lowly, healing the souls, the eyes of the blind being opened. The good news does not reach those who dwell in kings' houses. Thank God it is not always so. There are men in high rank who are also living close to Christ. Herod is often thought to have been a Sadducee. In all probability, he had no real religious convictions, but inconsistencies are common in human nature, and the unbelieving are quite often superstitious. Herod was haunted by a guilty conscience, 
the spectres of those whom he had foully murdered, troubled his dreams. Christ's mighty works excited his attention. No ordinary man, even he, realised, could do such things. It must be someone more than mortal, someone in whom the powers of the unsealed world, unseen world, were active and energetic. Conscience whispered, and an awful shudder rippled through the despot's soul. It is John, John, the one I beheaded. Better to be the most miserable prisoner, perishing in the gloomy dungeons of Macareus, than that tyrant, whom the world called happy, terror-stricken in his gilded palace. He wished to see Christ, but the Lord would not come. He had departed to a desert place. I will come and heal him, he said, when the centurion said for him, but he would not go to Herod. For what were Herod's motives? In part, merely curiosity, partly that awful power of conscience which seems sometimes to draw the criminal to the scene of his crime or the murdered body of his victim. Partly, perhaps, malice and fear. Maybe he would have slain the Lord as he had slain the prophet. But our Lord Christ does not manifest himself to those who seek him from evil motives such as these. Herod would see him again, at last, and the sight would do him no good. It increased his condemnation. He set Christ at naught and shared with Pilate the guilt of his death. So what was this sin of Herod? He had married Herodias, the wicked woman who had ensnared him with her deceitful beauty. She was not content with the quiet life of her husband Philip, but sought rank, wealth and magnificence. Antipas was the greatest prince of the family, and she lured him to his ruin. She cared not about sin or shame or scandal, so that she might encompass her wicked purpose. Now she was the Tetrarch's queen, but her soul was stained with the double guilt of incest and adultery. What is beauty of person when it hides a black and loathsome, vile soul? Herod was weak and self-indulgent. He well fell into the snares of Herodias. He took her from her husband. The stronger will of that wicked woman led him on from sin to sin, and she became a second Jezebel to a second Ahab. This earned the rebuke of John. John, in his time, had had considerable influence with Herod. St. Mark tells us that Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man and holy, and observed him, or rather, kept him in safety. And when he heard him, he did many things, or rather he was much perplexed, and heard him gladly. Herod had paid some attention to John, partly perhaps from political reasons. For John had been for some time a great influence politically in the land, and partly from curiosity, and some sort of languid interest in John's mission and character. He was struck too with the intense earnestness of his preaching. He felt the power of his commanding personality. Worldly men will sometimes take a kind of interest in religious matters. Statesmen are often forced to do so from the widespread influence of religious motives. Men are attracted by strong character or great spiritual eloquence. But this external interest in religion may coexist with irreligious habits and a hatred of religious restraints. And John the Baptist knew this well. He did not care to retain Herod's favour at the cost of condoning his sin. He wanted Herod's soul, his spiritual good, 
and not his patronage. And so he rebuked him boldly for his sin again and again. It is not lawful for you to have her. John possessed in a high degree that holy courage which is so often necessary in dealing with souls. It is easy to speak to the humble and timid of their faults, but when the sinner is great and powerful, stern and perhaps masterful, it takes a brave man, man then to set his sin before him, urging him to repentance. But John did so plainly. The guilty pair must be separated. Nothing else could avail, Herod. No affectation of religious behaviour. No costly gifts, no patronage of John's cause. He could not be saved from his sin. That was impossible. He must, however, tear himself from it. So what was the answer of Herod? Casting John into prison. Wicked men will do the like now as far as lies in their power. They will do all they can to injure the faithful Christian who reproves them for their soul's good. And thus it was with Herod. John might reprove the Pharisee and the Sadducee, the publican and the soldier. But when he came to reprove Herod himself, Herod had him shut up in prison. This would have been a hard lot for one like John, accustomed to the free open life of the desert, to be penned up in a wretched dungeon. Herod would have put him to death at once, his own anger prompted him. Herodias urged him to do so in her most unfeminine malice. But we read, he feared the people. And as St Mark tells us, he feared and respected John himself. Herod feared John. He feared the people, but he did not fear God. John feared God, and that holy fear raised him above all other fears. He feared nothing else but only God. Oh, for the brave and holy faith to keep the fear of God in our hearts, and in that fear always to obey him. Worldly men are restrained from crime by some lower motive. It was a selfish fear that kept Herod for a while from the awful guilt of murder. And so we arrive at that fateful birthday feast. There were indeed high festivities at Macarius to celebrate Herod's birthday, or perhaps the anniversary of his accession to the throne. He had gathered indeed a great company around him, his lords, captains and chief estates of Galilee. We may be sure his guests were well entertained with all the costly luxury of the time. Even the Roman Perseus had heard of the sumptuousness of these Herodian banquets. But there was one show which could not have been expected. Salome, Herod's own niece, the great granddaughter of Mamniamni, the descendant of the long line of Asmonian princes, so utterly forgot the delicacy of a Hebrew maiden and the decorum of a princess as to dance alone amongst Herod's nobles whilst excited by feasting and excited by wine. Vashti, the Persian queen, had forfeited the crown rather than even appear at such a disgusting banquet. Salome, it seems, came unbidden, and all the bright beauty of her early youth danced before the assembled guests. It was unbecoming and indecent. But the guests were delighted, and strange to say, Herod too was pleased, though it was his own niece, and now his stepdaughter, who was thus transgressing the accepted rules of decent society. Feasting and wine often lead to sin. A simple life is safer for the Christian. In his excitement and folly, Herod promised her with an oath 
whatever she asked. He invoked the holy name of God at this wild, dissolute feast. He swore to what he knew not. Wine and luxury helped the devil in his work of slaying souls. The plot had been laid. The princess was instructed by her wicked mother. The malice of hell lurked under the girlish beauty of Salome. That fatal oath was to bring the most awful guilt upon the soul of Herod. For Salome claimed his promise. I wish you to give me the head of John the Baptist. She would have said it immediately. The tetrarch was weak and vacillating, and she would hold him to his wicked oath. She would have it there and then, on a plate, on one of those great banqueting dishes, perhaps silver or gold, which had been used at that sumptuous banquet, a thing ghastly and horribly exceeding. The king was sorry. He had hated John. Once he had wished to kill him, but not now. He feared the people, and his old reverence for John came rushing back, and he shrank from the fearful deed. But he had sworn. All his courtiers had heard him. He had not cared for the shame of his niece, but he would thought it would be a shame that a prince would break his word, being false to his oath. He thought much more of those half-drunken guests who sat around than he thought of God. For had he thought of God's honour, his conscience would have told him that to break such an oath was far less insulting to the honour of God than to keep it. It was exceedingly sinful to swear, as Herod had done, exposing himself to the snare of the devil. But it was beyond all comparison more wicked to keep the wicked oath than to break it. Herod's grief did not save him. It was only the sorrow of the world, not godly sorrow, and not repentance. But the wicked woman gave him no time for thought. She forced him to send an executioner immediately. And John was beheaded there and then in the prison. It was a noble death, the death of a hero, the death of a saint, a high saint of God. Salome may bear the bleeding head on the golden charger, a strange burden for so young and beautiful a princess. Herodias might exult over it in her gratified malice, but the holy martyr's soul was safe in paradise. Herod might wear his blood-stained crown, but John had received the crown of glory that never fades. He left behind a glorious example. Let us ask God to give us his grace that we may truly repent according to the Baptist teaching, and following his example constantly speak the truth, boldly rebuke vice, and patiently suffer for the sake of truth itself. We read that the disciples of John cared for a decent burial. Herod, conscious stricken perhaps already, would not have hindered them. They laid his body in the grave and then went and told Jesus. It was as he would have wished. He himself, while living, had sent his own followers to Christ. Look, the Lamb of God, he said to them, and now that he was dead, to whom should his disciples go but to see the Lord? he had honoured, before whose face he had been sent. In our turn we should go to Christ in all our troubles, and we should tell him. He will listen, and he will give us his loving sympathy. He will be a father to the fatherless, and a husband to the widow. In our great and in our little troubles, in the bitter sorrow of bereavement, in all the petty vexations of daily life, let us tell Jesus. If we come to him in faith and love, we shall never come in vain. 
So what can we learn from today's Gospel reading? We should never despise anyone because of their possible humble origin. It is a sinful thing in a Christian whose king was called the carpenter's son. We must remember to honour God's saints, for to honour them is to honour God whose servants they are. We should flee always from any hint of envy, for it kills the soul. We must be careful to use all the means of grace we can. Let us never drive Christ away through unbelief and hardness of heart. As Christians, we are called upon to rebuke vice at every opportunity. So let us do it fearlessly when it is our duty to do so. What danger there is in feasting, for it invariably ends in sin. Christians must be temperate in all things and never make rash oaths, or they lead to the most intense guilt. Do not take God's holy name in vain. One small sin leads to a bigger sin. Hate the beginnings of every sin, however little. Repent of the smallest sins, and you will avoid the bigger sins. Bring all your troubles to Christ and he will help you bear them. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, mercifully look upon our infirmities, and in all our dangers and necessities, stretch forth your right hand to help and defend us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.